Hi there, this is John Evans, and welcome back to another episode of Book and Spade. Today we're going to discuss a highly controversial issue, and one which I would like to encourage you to have an open mind about. It is one which I am not going to give any definitive opinion about, because any findings um, at this point are simply hearsay, and there are conflicting interpretations of the biblical record. We are going to discuss Noah's Ark. Now, what is fascinating about this is it largely deals with how we read the first 11 chapters of Genesis. There are some who firmly hold to the belief, uh, usually in a secular uh, humanist setting, that the book is merely fictional or allegorical for God's wrath on humanity and our need for repentance. Then there are those who claim that the first 11 chapters, uh, such as Ken Ham of Ans Answers in Genesis um, and many other uh, Bible creationists, uh, who claim that this record is um, a, a fundamentalist account, that it is absolutely historical. Um, and as evidence, they provide the fact that every culture in the history of the world um, has a flood myth, um, the Chinese, uh, have a myth about a man in a boat and that man trying to save animals. Uh, the Native Americans spread across North America, particularly I believe the Hopi Indians have uh, a story about a man who saves his family um, by means of a boat from a great flood and puts animals on it. Uh, we have, of course, the uh, Indian myth, the Hindu myth of Manu, uh, the fish god who speaks uh, to a prophet Manu uh, in order to save all the life of those on the planet Earth, and he builds an ark and a boat and, and saves his family. It's a universal story, and it goes back, um, as far as we can tell, to uh, our earliest recollections of, of our time. But of course, um, the problem is, uh, according to our contemporary form of geology and of history and of science, we know for a fact that um, it, it, this narrative of a large flood seems to not necessarily fit current, current models for the age of the earth. So this leaves uh, open the question, is the ark um, a genuine historical artifact which can be located? Um, is um, the story provided in Genesis, I believe chapters six through nine, uh, something that we can rely upon as fact? Well. For many people, their way of settling this issue is trying to find the literal remains of Noah's Ark. And putting uh, geology aside, uh, putting um, um, a lot of interpretations about what the narrative means aside, um, I would like you to take into consideration the eyewitness evidence. Now, as anyone knows who, who has spent any time dealing in criminal justice, eyewitness evidence is never perfect. Um, even people who have seen the exact same event um, often uh, do not share the same details. Uh, a perfect biblical example of this is, of course, the resurrection of Christ. We know for a fact, historically, that the person of Yeshua, who we believe to be God incarnate, Jesus Christ, rose from the dead. We have his tomb in Jerusalem. I believe it to be the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, some people believe it to be the garden tomb, but that's an issue for another time. Uh, we know for a fact that his disciples uh, claimed he rose from the dead, and we know they were all martyrs for their faith. Yet the accounts of the resurrection are conflicting. And the fact that they are conflicting um, provides evidence that it wasn't concocted. Well, we could use a similar basis uh, for eyewitness testimony about Noah's Ark. Of course, the question is where to look. Uh, which mountain would be the most reliable candidate for this. We have, of course, uh, Mount Ararat in Armenia. Uh, I believe the Armenian name is Agrida, the painful mountain. And uh, of course, this is uh, a volcanic mount. Uh, it has two peaks, uh, Greater Ararat and Lesser Ararat. Uh, and um, expeditions have been sent there uh, for as long as we can remember. Uh, in fact, uh, Alexander the Great was in contact, I believe, with a historian called uh, Barossus. And um, he claimed that there was a boat which saved all of humanity uh, at one point by being a shelter 
during a, a great flood, which uh, settled on top of a great mountain, and that people went to this uh, site in order to um, to see this ancient relic. So people have associated Barossus' account with uh, Mount Ararat in Armenia, although some people believe it to be other sites. Flavius Josephus and Marco Polo also agree that there was a dark-shaped object, which seems to have been a boat up um, in a mountain, roughly in that region of the world, which people would go to and ship off pieces as uh, souvenirs or or a Bedouin. So we don't, we're not quite sure if this is the mount, but this was the traditional site for hundreds and hundreds of years. So people have gone up and um, have been taken um, to many locations, which are believed to have been uh, Noah's Ark. One such eyewitness, of course, is Ed Davis back in, uh, I believe, 1947. Ed Davis was uh, a member of the United States military during the Second World War. He was stationed in um, not Armenia, but Iran, interestingly enough. And in Iran, he befriended uh, some local uh, Kurdish shepherds. And the Kurds there um, respected him because he was very supportive of the locals. He made sure that they received water and, and supplies. So according to Davis's account, he was like an almost um, adopted member of their family. Well, they took him to their houses and they had some pretty peculiar artifacts. They had a uh, petrified door covered in what appeared to be a bluish moss, uh, several petrified uh, shepherd's crooks. These are staffs, which would be held by a shepherd. Uh, we also have uh, evidence uh, that he came across some pottery and, and other wares, which supposedly came from the Ark. Now, Davis was, was curious. I, I don't think he went at this believing right off the bat that the Kurds who were providing this evidence were telling the truth. I think he was open-minded but curious. And we know this because he asked uh, to, to see the Ark, and they agreed to show it to him. Now, they brought him up a mountain, and there's a lot of controversy about what mountain this was. Uh, but he wrote down in his own diary or in his own copy of the Bible, depending on which recording uh, you listen to, he made many recordings of his eyewitness, um, that he went up uh, a large embankment uh, for many, uh, well, for a long time. He saw at the bottom of a valley a large petrified structure which appeared to be a boat with darkened timbers. Some of them uh, split off at the bottom of what seemed to be an ice cliff or glacier. We'll come back to this point later. Uh, and the boat-shaped object was split in two. And the rumor was that many people had gone into the boat uh, at night uh, trying to uh, bring away relics, and the local Kurds said there was a curse on the area and many people died inside the Ark. Now this sounds superstitious, um, but perhaps the conditions inside that structure, if it does exist, uh, would have been um, so inhospitable. And keep in mind, this is at a high elevation that anyone who would want to stay there overnight for religious reasons could easily uh, have been frozen to death. So I can easily see why um, this would not be necessarily a good place to stop and camp overnight. So Davis was shown this object. He was convinced that this was the Ark. He returned home, uh, and yet he did something very fascinating. He sat on the information, he shared it with friends, and he tried not to make any money off of it. This is not a guy who went to National Geographic and said, oh, you didn't jump up and down and say, uh, I want a million bucks, please produce a documentary. In fact, um, his work was so obscure uh, for a time that most people never heard of Davis's name up until um, James Irwin, who was uh, one of the Apollo astronauts, I believe he was the seventh or sixth person to walk on the moon, was interested in going to Armenia and discovering the Ark. And he looked through all the eyewitnesses he could, and guess what? He found Davis's account, and he found it compelling. But he, you know, Irwin, being also to a, you know, a scientist, this was not someone who was going to go at this issue, uh, you know, purely on blind speculation. He wanted um, to know if this was plausible. So he took Davis and he subjected him to a polygraph test a lie detector test. And what's fascinating is um, they went through several rigorous sessions um, and lo and behold, 
um, he passed. He passed with flying colors. This does not mean Ed Davis saw the Ark on Mount Ararat. But what this does mean uh, that Ed Davis believed he certainly saw an object on top of that mount. Uh, and that is of extreme interest. Why? Well, what's interesting is Ed Davis's eyewitness account matches identically another very obscure eyewitness of Noah's Ark, uh, which he clearly would not have heard about. And this eyewitness is of the name uh, George Higopian. Now, George Higopian uh, was a native Armenian. He lived near and around the site of Mount Ararat. Um, and of course, what this meant for us um, is uh, he knew the local geography. In fact, unlike Davis's account, where he's very unclear about what mountain he went to, um, in Hagopian's account, he gives you a literal uh, description of the landmasses and how he got to the site. He claims his uh, father or grandfather, who was a local Armen Armenian minister, uh, took him to the location. And that there was uh, a boat-shaped object. It was next, next to a glacier, just like the Davis account. Uh, that it had uh, some steps leading up to it, which clearly were not made by Noah, if this is indeed the Ark. Um, and that the structure um, seems to have been intact as early as the, uh, the 1900s, but later that it could have broken into, that it could have disintegrated. So we have a structure broken in two pieces beside a glacier during a high melting year. Why are these two accounts virtually identical? And yet both eyewitnesses uh, had no contact with each other, uh, don't seem to have uh, tried to profit off of their findings. George Jacobian, uh, although he was a businessman, never went and tried to make a documentary about his evidence, never sought out monetary um, rewards for his work. He simply documented it, sat on the information, uh, and died a peaceful believer in the Lord. What this suggests to me is that they definitely saw something, and they believed that something to be a boat. The question is, was it a boat? George Agopian seems to have provided the answer. He claims as a little boy, he not only saw the ark firsthand, he claims he walked on top of it. Now this is a ludicrous claim at first. After all, we have a boat um, located beside a glacier covered probably in a thick layer of permafrost at the very least. Yet, yet remember uh, Davis's account, the local Bedouin shepherds uh, or Kurds, you know, uh, probably went up there and they took objects from the ark. That means they probably went to this site and cleared some of the, the debris. And in fact, um, there is evidence from Barosis as early as the time of Alexander the Great that people went to the site and cleared it. So this is an obvious candidate wherever this, this, this boat is. Now, I would hasten to remind you that both Hugopian's account and Davis's account took place at a time in which there was a, uh, a strong melting year uh, for Armenia. Uh, it was very hot, and therefore you could expect that the Ark would have been uncovered. Unfortunately, since then, there's been uh, layers and layers and layers of, uh, of frost which has remained. Another common critique as to why the Ark obviously cannot be on Mount Ararat uh, is the idea that many sightings take place near a very volcanic section of the mountain called the Ahura Gorge. Uh, this is a site uh, which suffered um, a great disaster back in the 19th century, an eruption, which uh, basically sent a large ash layer down upon many monasteries and destroyed several relics. Here's the funny thing about this. Um, we have evidence that perhaps that volcanic eruption may have led to uh, whatever the structure is, be it the ark or, or be it not, to, uh, to thaw out of the ice. Because a string of eyewitnesses associated with the ark uh, throughout the 19th century occur shortly after this eruption. Um, in fact, we have descriptions of a boat near a glacier uh, as early, I believe, as 1860 or 1870. And all of these accounts seem to be fitting with Gopian and with Davis. Now, there are other um, suggestions and candidates, of course, for Noah's Ark. Uh, some people claim it is on a mud flow located not far from um, Agrida, and uh, that this structure uh, 
is uh, more likely. This location is on a mountain range or a series of peaks, and this seems to match the biblical record because we read in Genesis that Noah's Ark landed on the mountains, the plural, mountains of Ararat, not necessarily the mountain of Ararat. In fact, many people believe the word Ararat refers to uh, not a specific peak in the region, but to a mountain chain or to a kingdom of Eratu. Um, the thing about this, though, is this site, uh, popularized by the uh, self-styled archaeologist uh, Ron White, and I believe, um, you know, with Larry Williams or in David Fossil, uh, the problem is uh, it has been suggested that it is simply a natural rock formation. It's a large stone structure which fits the uh, general cubits for, for the ark. Uh, it's located um, at a high elevation far above the sea level. And in a nearby village, what's very interesting is they have these large stones called drogue stones. Now these stones um, are, I w if I remember correctly, around 15 feet tall. And they have holes located in the top of them. And they look like giant anchors used for the ballast of a ship. Uh, and yet they're located above, far above the sea level, in a remote village, um, far away from um, any quarry where they could be constructed. And what's interesting is there are eight of these stones. Now, there were supposedly eight survivors of the Ark. Now, on these stones, we have large Byzantine crosses, suggesting that they are tombstones. Um, and the locals have dug up these, um, these sites, and there were local reports that they found very large skeletons. But the problem with all of these accounts is they're very hearsay. The stones are not hearsay. You can go and visit, um, I believe it's in Abiasid, um, these, these drogue stones, and you can see the crosses imprinted on them. I'm more interested in the Byzantine architecture uh, or etchings on top of the stones because it tells me that the Byzantine Empire which um, existed from the time of Constantine up until uh, the time of the Crusades, thought that this was the site of Noah's Ark. Um, th that means this was a pilgrimage site, uh, potentially as early as 300 uh, AD. But it's still uncertain and it's still very unclear to me. So I like to look at all this evidence speculatively. Last but not least, there are some people who claim even to this day that um, the Ark is on Mount uh, Judy. Mount Judy is a peak, um, uh, of course, in the Palestinian region of the world. Uh, it's the peak associated with the Quran. And according to many scholars, there is a large stone tomb located nearby, uh, which is very large. Uh, it's, it's gigantic, in fact, associated with Noah. Of course, uh, carbon dating has been done on organic material near the tomb, and it dates nowhere to the time of Noah. Now, out of all three candidates, um, I obviously want to avoid giving you uh, a definitive answer saying this is the Ark. In fact, I think that we should treat the first 11 chapters of Genesis with an open mind and at least try to view these documents on one hand, as giving very powerful and compelling archaeological and historical evidence. We have lists of genealogies from Adam to Noah, uh, describing figures as uh, detailed as Methuselah, giving issues of geography. And these details don't seem to have been made up uh, out of thin air, unless we had a prehistoric version of J.R.R. Tolkien running around. At the same time, I recognize uh, the advances of contemporary geology. Uh, and I understand that uh, these findings seem to be backed up by a considerable amount of evidence. And therefore, um, if it was proven that the Ark was on none of these mountains, and that it never was there, this would not destroy my faith personally. Um, as a devout Roman Catholic, um, you know, we hold to the belief that we can read um, the first 11 chapters of um, of the book of Genesis as, as simply a matter of both history and allegory. However, I think that we have neglected many historical proofs that could lead us to a more thorough understanding of these chapters. And this eyewitness evidence is so fascinating that I personally believe that it is possible 
very possible that an artifact does exist on Mount Ararat. Uh, and a real artifact or series of artifacts could exist near the mud flow uh, located on the peak, uh, transliterated as Doomsday Mountain. Um, and if that is the case, uh, we should treat these artifacts seriously. We should send further investigations there so we can encourage you and all of us to make up our own minds about the evidence. Either way, I affirm that the biblical record is true, that it is um, divinely inspired, and that we should continue to um, hold fast to our faith, even in the face of conflicting reports and evidences. This is only the tip of the iceberg, uh, and I hope to provide more evidence soon. But I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to research uh, the findings of Bob Cornuk of the, uh, the Base Institute. I want you to read uh, the books published by James Irwin's family. I want you to look up George Agopian and Davis's testimony so that you can learn for yourself and believe for yourself whether this information is true. I encourage questions, and I hope to hear from all of you very soon.